white words fade on and off a black background. In the early 1980s, theologian John Hull lost his sight. He began keeping an audio diary. But John wasn't the only member of the family making recordings at that time. In this film, the voices of the Hull family are lip-synced by actors. A tape spool turns. Hello, this is the tape of Imogen's Tape, produced in the 1980s in 17 Alton Road. Hello. White letters on black, Radio H. A train window rushes past foliage. The whole question of what you can remember as a child is an interesting one, isn't it? The foliage is blurred by the train's speed. So much has been written about my father. It's hard to unpick what's remembered and what isn't. A younger Imogen looks out of a train window. When I was six, my mum remarried and we moved down to Dorset. I used to come back up to Birmingham every fortnight for the weekend. Dad would come all the way down to Poole, which was four or five hours on the train, pick me up from school, and then we'd travel all the way back that same day. Special times together. Imogen leads her father down a train corridor. I think that transition from him leading me to me leading him must have been quite a slow one. The little girl presses her hand to the train window as she looks out at cornfields. I remember saying to him around that time, can you see me now at all? And I remember him turning and, and spending a while looking at me and then saying, are you wearing a red dress? She looks down and smiles. She is wearing red. I think that must have been the last time that he saw me. The trees race by. Aerial against a cloudy sky. Radio Edge. And now we're going to have a little look at some of the programmes on this morning. In a few minutes, there's some jokes and fun and songs. Because I was an only child up until seven, eight, and yeah, onwards. And here I am on something to do. Oh, I'm just going to see if there's anything we can do today. Hello, and here's a brief summary of the news. Margaret Thatcher banned national health classes today, giving one, the extra two to Richard character missiles to be installed. Not to mention, but this is actually cream with chicken soup. Now this and is now his weather. I'll see you in a few minutes. I mean, I wonder at some level whether I was mirroring the fact that Dad was doing a lot of recording. Familiarity, predictability, the same objects, the same little movements of the hand. That sound of the of the tape clicking off and clicking on and rewinding. That was the sound that you knew Dad was awake. Like you might see a light on, I suppose. I don't remember him discussing that with me. I can imagine that he would have recorded that diary at work or in his office late at night. For all his mischief and his humour, <laughs> you know, those huge amounts of time that he spent with us, he was in many ways a, a very private man. Tape boxes stacked on shelves. I guess hearing the tapes now has been very painful for a lot of reasons. Not least because he, he kept such a lot from us, I think. You know, it's only really now that I realise what an enormous upheaval his sight loss was for him. A book titled Touching the Rock sits on a shelf with other books. The image blurs into a hazy figure on a grand staircase viewed from below. I remember the sound of that cane clicking up and down in the corridors of the university where he used to work. A glass dome above the staircase comes into focus. Walking up and down there with him, 
and him showing me how he was using that cane, training me how best to support him. Imogen cycling down the road. And I think, you know, he must have placed quite a lot of trust in me. And that must have been part of a huge process of letting go of vast amounts of control. I certainly learned how to get around in the world. Maybe it has given me a certain amount of confidence that things will be all right. You know, there's only so lost you can get. John prepares to record a performance with Imogen and her younger siblings. Is it the right way up? Yeah. Right, stick it through. You know, you'd come in with a song or a poem that you'd written and Dad would say, oh, just a minute, we'll just put the tape recorder on. I guess for him it was kind of like sticking photos in a photo album. OK, John, what time? How does that go, Dad? 25th of August, 1984. I am speaking in Melbourne, Australia, with my mother. Yes. Now, let's see, Mother. I guess for him it converted it into something which he could relive. Good, that's good. Then at 11 there'll be some more frightening stories in a visit to Daddy's House of Horror. The stories were legend. Are you sitting comfortably? This five-legged beast of Borneo. Don't go alone to Daddy's House of Horror. Scare the living daylights out of everybody. Imogen pops up wearing a cowboy hat. Ah, Mr. Bartender, I'll have a bottle of whiskey. S -s Certainly, there you are. Don't bother about the cup, I'll just drink it out of the bottle. Definitely really good on sound effects. <laughs> <laughs> Would you like another one, mate? What, another one? You, you must know, for be crazy, ain't statue, you? Quite a childish sense of humour, really. <laughs> Imogen ducks down below the counter. The image blurs. His education of us was totally about trying to get us to see the world through different eyes. I remember being taken to the Jewish temple, to the Hindu temple. All kinds of very different experiences. As quite a young child, really. You know, he was always very keen for us to see difference and to have different perspectives on the world. Imogen holds John's arm to guide him along a street. I mean, you only need to sort of walk through crowds to see how people respond when you're walking with someone with sight loss. No, thanks. We're fine. Thanks for asking. It's the sort of fear that people have around a lot of disability, isn't it? It's that sort of sense that there's this kind of aura around someone. I guess those experiences of the discrimination and the patronising gave him huge insight into people who are marginalised. How can blind and sighted people truly understand each other? Can we have insight into other people? This is the great question upon which the unity of our humanity hangs. Without that personal, direct experience of humility, I think he would have been a very different man. Don't forget to tune in again next week, boys and girls, when we'll be bringing you more music and songs. See you soon. A tape clicks off. Rain obscures a view of trees, draining their colour to a murky grey. As I got older, we'd sit and drink whiskey together in his study which had this corrugated roof that maximised the sound of falling rain. Two tumblers of whisky stand waiting. The adult Imogen is with her father. You know, we'd listen to comedy and music. We'd read poetry together and talk about philosophical concepts, political ideas. Colour TV images of protesters. He really found this whole kind of second wind of, of active protest in his later years. I remember one winter he went all the way up to Scotland to campaign at this base where they were building a nuclear submarine. He must have been in his 70s and uh, he got himself arrested. A police station at night. They obviously didn't know what to do with him. He started asking them if he could have a Bible. And then when they brought the Bible in, he said, well, that's no use to me, I need a Braille Bible. And I think at that point they just thought, God, <laughs> what are we going to do with this guy? 
Sunlight flickers through leaves seen through a car window. He was in a pretty bad way. He'd been out most of the night in the cold. Had to stop at practically every service station on the way back just for him to kind of get himself back to strength. But he also was just so invigorated by that whole new side of things. In John's empty office, tiny motes of dust float in the air. A clock on a wall, the time made unreadable by shadows. Hello, Imogen. How are you? <laughs> oh, good. You're good. I sometimes Enjoy. worry that in that last upstairs. decade together, when Dad was, I suppose, getting more tired, really, and just withdrawing more into his world of thought, and I was busy, I had young kids, I was working hard on building up my career. I look back and I think maybe I should have made more time to sit in the rain with him and listen to poetry and drink whiskey. But I guess we always feel like that about people that we've lost. A black screen. The camera travels past tape boxes stacked on shelves. Listening to the tapes now and hearing him go through that process of acceptance around his sight loss, I guess, just felt like the process that I've been through around my grief, I suppose. Going through that stage of, of feeling that this can't be happening to you and shouldn't be happening to you. To move through that and feel, well, actually, there is meaning in here and there is, there is hope in here. And what do I do with that next? And I went to go and see him a couple of days afterwards in the mortuary, which I was really glad I did. And put my hands on his head and, you know, I just kind of... I suppose the thing I said to him was, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll carry all this on, you know the fight for social justice and trying to make a difference and the things that you believed in. Um, it's in safe hands. The trees clear, revealing a wide open cornfield. The screen blacks out. White words fade on and off. Before his death, John's audio diaries were transcribed and published to critical acclaim under the title Touching the Rock. In 2016, his and Imogen's recordings were incorporated into the feature film and virtual reality experience, Notes on Blindness. Having worked as a frontline social worker, Imogen now runs a consultancy working to promote equality and inclusion. The adult Imogen sits on a train, gazing out at the passing countryside. She's wearing red. The screen fades to black. Thank you very much for listening in. The end. <laughs>